conduct during the, during the Civil War. And so that's what got me started. At first, I thought it would be just a book about civil liberties in the Civil War. But then uh, it turned out that didn't seem to have qu quite enough material for an entire book. And I got interested in carrying it forth, you know, carrying it forward into World War I, World War II. Yeah, what, what, what Lincoln said was, uh, he said if, if Roger Tawney's judgment that he had no authority by himself to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in Baltimore should uh, be given effect, uh, you would be letting all the laws but one go unexecuted and the government itself go to pieces lest that one be violated. And that's, he just phrased beautifully the classical confrontation between the needs of a government at war and the civil liberties of the citizens. You can see the interview with Chief Justice Rehnquist in its entirety, Sunday night at 9 Eastern and 1.30 a.m. Eastern on Book TV on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. Now to Vermont for a discussion between the candidates for a U.S. Senate seat. For the next hour, incumbent Democrat Patrick Leahy and Republican challenger Fred Tuttle talk about the issues. Our guests this evening are incumbent Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy and Republican U.S. Senate candidate Fred Tuttle. Welcome to Switchboard. Good to be with you. I'm happy to be with you. Very happy. I'd like to mention right at the outset that Switchboard tonight is being taped by Vermont Public Television for broadcast later this evening, so if you'd like to see Switchboard, tune in to Vermont Public Television tonight at 9.30. Now here's the format that we're using tonight and that we've used for all of our campaign debates this fall. During the first section of the program, the candidates will have an opportunity to ask each other questions. We'll try to get three rounds of questions in. And then the second half of the program will feature calls from listeners and answers should be limited to a minute from each candidate and both candidates will have the opportunity to respond to the caller's question. And then we'll end the program tonight with a one-minute closing statement from each candidate. And as been our custom during these campaign debates, we like to start with the challenger and give that person an opportunity to ask the first question. So the first question tonight comes from Fred Tuttle for Patrick Leahy. Senator Leahy, uh, let's start off with an easy one. Can you name all the three Great Lakes? Well, there's more than three. <laughs> there is? Oh, I didn't but, know that. But, but I, um, I've always thought that... Um, Lake Champlain was one, but they don't let me do that. But they're they're uh, Huron, Ontario, uh, Michigan, Erie, and Superior, oh, the yeah. Great Lakes. Yeah, it's five of them. Yeah, the, yeah. so those are the five. They're uh, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, um, Erie, and Superior. But I really wanted to have Lake Champlain it, be one of those. It seems so. Lake Champlain should have been one. Yeah, of them. I really agree. Does. I agree. But they didn't let me do it. No. Can I ask? Yeah. Okay. Can I? You know, you've, um, Fred, you've been here in Vermont. I, I think of the, the evening uh, Marcel and I came over and had <coughs> dinner with you and Dottie. And you were telling me all the various yeah. stories about when you were young in oh, Vermont. Sure. Tell me, in the years you've been here, you've, we've, you've seen the 27 flood oh, and yes. the pressure and everything else. Who's been, in your estimation, the best governor and the best president we've had during your 79 uh, years. Roosevelt was the best president. Uh, the governor, the best one we had was back in, I can't remember his name, maybe you had back in the 40s, in the 50s. Uh, well, I was born in 1940. Yeah, but, this was during World War yeah. II, the best governor. Oh, probably Ernest Gibson? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I he was a good friend of my parents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know what, um, all I know what my dad said. He, yeah. was, he was the best president. Yeah, yeah. the best governor, okay. The best governor. All right, you got another question, I guess. Yep, it's round two, and we'll go to Fred Tuttle. Pat, we have sex here in Vermont. There's Essex, and there's your hometown of Middlesex. But what are we going to do about that mess in Washington? <laughs> Fred, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't run for the United States Senate. I'd run for president. <laughs> But that would be a good but, idea. But let me tell you right now, if I carried on like that in Washington, Marcel wouldn't let me come home to Middlesex. <laughs> oh, no. So can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. Um, and this may seem straight. I've always wondered. Now, you, you've had more experience in agriculture than I'll ever have. Why is it, and I don't know the answer to this one, why is it do white hens, 
always lay white eggs. Brown hens always lay brown eggs. Do you know why that is? I really don't know how that is, but I I don't know. I feel years ago they kept a white rooster the white hens and the brown rooster were the brown hens. But they always... Uh, always come out this, yeah. that color, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know the answer either. So no, I, just I don't to... either. Okay, go ahead. Just before we get to another question from Fred Tuttle, let me, one more. let me give uh, some phone numbers out here. 1-800-639-2211 is our phone number here at Switchboard. We're going to be going to calls very soon. If you've got a question or a comment for either or both of our candidates tonight, feel free to give us a call at one 800 639-2211 and become part of the program tonight uh, as we talk to the U.S. Senate candidates. And we have another question from Fred Tuttle. Uh, Pat, as a U.S. Senator, your health care coverage is a lot better than mine. I'm a veteran and a senior citizen. Is that fair? No, it is not fair. It is not fair at all. Uh, I supported a program to say that everybody would get the same kind of uh, health care coverage. Now, I would point out that I I buy private health care insurance and, and always have. In fact, uh, if there's an emergency, and when I'm in the Senate, there's a Senate physician staying by. But I normally go to my own family doctor. But no, it's not fair. We all ought to have equal health care. The thing that bothers me as much as anything, we're the wealthiest nation history's ever known. We have a lot of countries that are nowhere near as wealthy as us, oh, and they all have equal health care. Oh, sure, Canada does. Yeah, yep. And it's, um, and I tell you, uh, somebody loses a job, they lose their health care. Uh, you get a lot of children who don't have health care. Uh, we, we could do better. Let me ask you uh, one last question, Fred. You've, you've been kind enough, and I must admit I've never had an experience like this before when I've, when I've run for office, yeah. but you've been kind enough to say you want me to be reelected. I do. Now, let's assume... I, I do get reelected. What would you want me? And remember, you're one of my favorite constituents. What would you want me to concentrate on the most when I go back uh, to the Senate? Perhaps uh, maybe the mountains in Vermont, the bushes, and maybe uh, the, the highways, the school system. We I don't believe the Senate can do much about it because that's local more. Yeah, than, more um, local. And maybe clean, now another thing I would like to see, Senator, is these rivers cleaned out and put on the highway. Now, up our road the other day, we were drawing that crushed granite up. And it's good, yep. after cut a tire, we have a river just full of gravel. And somebody asked me today, says, if you take gravel out of the river, the water's there. But when you take gravel out of the river, it's a dry season. The water runs around, you know, and plenty of room to load the gravel. You used to it by hand as a boy. And yeah. it's plenty of gravel for the road. Yeah, we saw some problems with that when the flooding this, uh, this oh, yeah. spring has yeah, resulted. Sure. Yeah. Good points. Thank you. We're just waiting for our phone calls to get queued up this evening. A lot of very interesting and strong phone response, and we're going to get to those phone calls in just a moment. But I know, Fred, you've got another question there. Maybe you could ask that. I thought we went to the three. Yeah, we're going to give Fred uh, number four oh. just while we're waiting for the phone calls. Oh. <laughs> oh. Pat, well, you got me, Fred. <laughs> the NRA recently endorsed you and gave you a B grade. They gave me an F and flunked me. What should I do to get better grades from the NRA? You know, I've never been able to figure out how they do the grading system, <laughs> uh, and I don't know the answer to that. But um, I would never flunk you on anything. Oh, I know so you I may, would, I, I may have gotten a B. I'll give you an A on whatever oh, you wanted. Okay. How's that? That's what I need is an A. Okay, you got it. Do you have another question no. that you'd like to, to ask uh, Fred Tuttle? Let me just follow up uh, while we're waiting to get our phone calls on the line here. You were talking about health care in response to a question from Fred Tuttle. Um, if I remember correctly, there was a patient bill of rights bill uh, discussed this yeah. year that would have given con consumers the right to sue HMOs. Did you support that? I did. And it's, um, I think that we should have had both a debate and a vote on it. You know, we spent a great deal of time in the Congress voting on a whole lot of things that bear no relevance to people. But I have had more mail, more calls on HMOs than just about anything I could think of. In fact, every weekend when I'm home, if I'm in a, a grocery store or something like this, people come up to me and talk to me about it. I think we've got to get back to a point where people have more choice over who their doctor is going to be and have more say over what their treatment is going to be, and not just an insurance company. My wife's a registered nurse. She most recently uh, was on a, 
uh, working on a medical surgical floor. Uh, I know some of the things that she tells me uh, about it. People are in and out of hospitals too fast. Uh, people are sent home uh, when they're really, many, many times, they're not ready to go home. They need more care. Uh, the hospitals are oftentimes understaffed on the kind of support staff like the nurses. And frankly, uh, the patient is the one that seems to have the least say in it. I don't think it should be that way. I think patients should have more say about their and, care. Don't you, Fred? Yeah, I do too. Now, years ago, every town had a doctor. That doctor worked 24 hours a day for years and years without a vacation or a day off or nothing. Anybody was sick, a doctor went out day or night, had a horse in wintertime sleigh, go way back on the hill for $2 a call and give a woman some medication or see what was wrong with her. If they were too wrong, they'd take them to the hospital. But if some in the doctor could repair to fix up quick, the doctor gave them the pills, and they didn't have all this running around, do going another miles here after that, and and the doctor finished their own medication for them. And I, I thought that was pretty good back in those days. Yeah. Let's go to our callers now. We're going to start with Ben, who's calling from Craftsbury. Hi, Ben. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi. Yes, I have a, I have a question for Senator Leahy. Uh, Mr. Leahy, you're one of the best known and probably best liked politicians in Vermont, and uh, uh, during the the campaign, uh, Mr. Tuttle was asked at one point that you uh, spend some of your uh, campaign uh, funds to acquire uh, farmlands or wildlands in Vermont to preserve them for the, the future of the state. It strikes me as a really positive uh, statement you could make. And, and given the fact that I think Vermonters uh, know you so well, uh, would, would you consider reducing some of your uh, campaign spending in order to uh, make a, a lasting contribution to the state by purchasing some lands, as Mr. Tillis suggested? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, I know the suggestion that uh, Mr. O'Brien had uh, put together that I give the money to, uh, I think, the Worcester Mountain Range. It, you, what you may not have known, and I think what Mr. O'Brien didn't know, is that I brought $340,000 uh, to buy lands connected with the uh, Worcester Range. Uh, it's a program of mine that has the farms for the future that has bought uh, uh, bought the rights to keep over a hundred farms going in Vermont. It's a legislation of mine that has added a hundred thousand acres to the Green Mountain National Forest. These are the ways that I have tried to help very much in in Vermont to uh, uh, to to uh, add to the beauty of our state. It's uh, uh, brought several millions of dollars to clean up Lake Champlain. These are other areas. Now, my campaign uh, account, of course, I could not use it for that uh, purpose. Uh, so I, I will not. Uh, but I will continue to bring in far, far more than I ever could out of any campaign account. And, of course, my wife and I have contributed to uh, various environmental and other areas here in Vermont, but we do that privately out of our own funds. Ben, thanks for your phone call. Let's turn to Bob, who's calling from Middlebury. Hi, Bob. Welcome to Switchboard. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been reading um, a farm journal uh, that's uh, produced in St. Johnsbury, and uh, it talks about uh, the legalization of hemp being a solution for um, not having to subsidize farmers the way we do. Uh, it would allow them a crop uh, that they could uh, earn two or three times more money than they make uh, growing hay. Uh, and I'd like to know your, your, both of your thoughts about that. Okay. Well, the, this is a question the state legislature could address if they wanted to uh, uh, legalize the growing of, of hemp in, in Vermont. If they were to do that, then we would look at it on the, on the federal level. Interestingly enough, while I hear from uh, uh, whatever, whatever this journal is, I've gotten a couple letters to that effect. I've not had any farmers, uh, and I have meetings with farmers all over the state all the time. I've yet to have one of them come up to me and say they'd like to do this. Fred, what do you think about that? Uh, I think maybe if they wanted to kind of legalize a little bit and have it something legal, if you don't have it legal and everybody goes out and reading it, it would just be an awful mess for the state and everybody would be sound it, children will have it, and I believe it wouldn't be very good. Okay, Bob, thanks for your phone call. Our phone number here at Switchboard, 1-800-639-2211. That's 1-800-639-2211. If you've got a question for either of our U.S. Senate candidates tonight, the Republican candidate is Fred Tuttle. 
And the Democrat is Patrick Leahy, who is a four-term incumbent. 1-800-639-2211. Let's talk to Lawrence, who's calling from Montpelier. Hi, Lawrence. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi, thank you. We've heard a lot about road issues in the governor's race here in Vermont. And I guess my question for both candidates is what could be done at the federal level on these issues? Go ahead, Fred. I don't really know. You go, you go. Well, Fred, for me to go ahead, I, um, <clears throat> we have substantially increased the amount of money that will come in the highway funds in something called Ice-T uh, this year in, in the budget that passed. That's something that uh, Senator Jeffords, Congressman Sanders, and I worked very closely together on. One of the things that I worked with, as did the other two members of the delegation, is to allow states like ours more flexibility in how we use federal highway funds. Uh, what may make sense in a highway, for example, in Oklahoma or in Florida may not make any sense in Vermont and vice versa. We need to have a lot more flexibility in the use of our, of our highway funds. For a little state of uh, just under 600,000 people, we do a very good job on our roads. But what I want is the flexibility so that the state administration in deciding if they want to use it for different things within the roads, they can. Also, uh, <coughs> some more flexibility for mass transit, for example, with Amtrak. And that, that we've been successful. So there will be a lot more money uh, for, for Vermont under the new highway bill, but there will also be a lot more flexibility. Fred, would you like to comment on that question? He done a good job on that. I cannot better that one bit. All right. <laughs> Lawrence, thanks for your question. Let's talk to David, who's calling from Burlington. Hi, David. Welcome to Switchboard. Thank you. Senator, uh, Fred asked you what you would do to clean up that mess in Washington, and I just wondered <laughs> what your position is relative to um, uh, the independent prosecutor, Ken Starr. Well, I, frankly, I believe Ken Starr has gone way beyond whatever was intended by the special prosecutor law. Uh, it's not just the $45 million that he spent, but now it's come out that he was working closely with the Paula Jones lawyers. That's something that prosecutors don't do. Uh, in fact, they have now opened, a, a interestingly enough, uh, an investigation, ethics investigation on Kenneth Starr and his, and his operation that, they may have mis that he may have misled the court, may have misled the um, attorney general, and certainly... Uh, in the material he gave the House representatives, it turns out he did not give them a, a full and complete story. Uh, as a result, most Republicans and Democrats agree that the special prosecutor law, as it's now written, will not be continued after next spring when it, uh, when it runs out. I think that, um, uh, and I've looked at this very, very seriously. I was a prosecutor for nearly nine years. Uh, I cannot condone some of the actions that Kenneth Starr took. I'm not excusing any conduct of the president, but I certainly cannot condone the way Kenneth Starr handled it. Okay, David, thanks very much for your phone call. Let's talk to Derek, who's calling from West Burke. Hi, Derek. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi, how you doing? Good. Uh, my question is threefold. First of all, do you feel that um, nuclear power is safe? Secondly, do you feel that the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant is safe? And thirdly, do you believe it's fair to ship the waste produced here to... Um, to Texas, to a poor community in Texas. Which one of us is that directed to? Why don't you start with yeah, that I'll one? Yeah, I'll first. Okay. Um, I think that nuclear power, a lot depends on the design. You take a, a nuclear power plant of the Chernobyl design that is not safe, and unfortunately there are many of them around the world, and I think people are sold to bill of goods on those uh, the Vermont Yankee has had some problems uh, on occasions. They are carefully regulated and watched. Uh, I believe they have corrected the problems when they have had them. On the question of waste to Texas, I was very pleased to see uh, about 45 minutes or a couple hours ago, Texas voted uh, in their commission to withhold the site that was selected until the, for waste uh, to be dumped until there is more of a study, until more of the people in that area have had a chance uh, to speak to the issue. I think that's right. I think that uh, Vermont and Maine and Texas entered into a valid contract for the storing of nuclear waste. 
but I think that Texas has a complete responsibility to the people of their state to make sure the place they put it is a safe one, and I think that their commission in voting, and I believe it was unanimous, I just got the news a, a few minutes before I went on the air, I voted unanimously to review further sites. Does that jeopardize the future of that compact at all? No, the compact is still a valid one. I mean, the, the legislature, the Vermont legislature, Republicans and Democrats voted for this. The uh, state legislature in, um, in Maine did the same. You enter into the uh, contract, but the contract states very, or the compact in this case, states very clearly that it has to be, um, uh, that Texas has full say over where it goes, and Texas has their own laws, uh, plus the usual national environmental laws, uh, they can't just go ahead and plop it down anywhere they want. They can't plop it down in the middle of somebody's water supply or something like that. Fred, any comment about that no, issue? No, Pat Leahy done a wonderful job on that. I, it's perfect. All right. Let's talk to Shabir, who's calling from Brattleboro. Hi, welcome to Switchboard. Yeah, hello. I have a question directed towards Fred. Um, my family runs a, a dairy farm here in West Brattleboro, and... Uh, but I've never milked a Jersey cow, and I'm wondering, uh, how many teats does a Jersey cow have? How many? The Jersey cow has four tits. Uh, somebody else told me they had six. Uh, sometimes they're born a uh, half a calf, Jersey half a calf is born with a little small extra tit. But you very seldom raise that animal because it, it always leaks milk, that one tit. Uh, what else you want to know? Oh, that's about it. I just... I wasn't sure if they had a... I don't know. Or... Some cows might have six tits. I don't know. We had a friend that told us once a cow had six tits. Maybe four. Okay. I think I've always seen four of them, but I, that's one thing i got to tell you right now. If I got a question like that, I think I know the answer. But if I ever get a question on the Senate floor of that nature, what I'm going to do is tell everybody, uh, time out. In my pocket, I carry Fred <laughs> Tuttle's telephone number. I'm going, to, I'm going in the cloakroom and call Fred. That's a good idea. I'm going to double-check that with Fred. That's a right. good idea. <laughs> I, I, I'm a lawyer, not a dairy farmer, so yeah. I'm going to call, I'm going to call <laughs> That's Fred. That's a good idea. <laughs> Shabir, thanks for your phone call. Let's talk to Sam now, who's calling from Norwich. Hi, Sam. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi. Thanks. I'm calling from Norwich, Vermont, and I just had a comment to both Mr. Leahy and Fred about the Mr. Leahy's question to Fred about white hens laying white eggs and brown hens laying brown eggs. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that there's a white hen called an arohana mm -hmm. that lays a green egg. Yeah, I don't. I never heard that, but I do believe it. Uh, now you're a hen person. You you've seen hens a long time. My grandma and my parents always had a lot of hens, but my wife and I haven't had them for years. But couldn't they cross up and lay a different color of egg? I don't, I really don't know. I don't know either. That's something you know I don't know about, isn't it? No. But I almost, I almost think they could. Hmm. A red rooster and a white hen don't seem to make some kind of an egg. Don't seem to be white. Don't seem to be red, but be some color. Yes. Am I right? You're right. You're okay. Sam, thanks I'm, for your phone call. I'm going to leave it to these two experts. I, I am in way over my head on this one. <laughs> Our phone number here at Switchboard is 1-800-639-2211. Our guests this evening, the U.S. Senate candidates, the Democratic candidate, Patrick Leahy, and the Republican candidate, Fred Tuttle. Let's talk to Dan, who is calling from Huntington. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I have a question uh, for both of you. Um, what do you think about the uh, the transition for the year 2000 and, and what the preparation the preparation level is for the federal federal government? Um, that is, do you think that the government is ready to handle that transition to the year 2000 in terms of computers and and or any other technical uh, devices? No, you you get it, Pat. You know more about that than I do. Well, it's uh, I, I think what he's calling about is the Y two K problem. Yeah. The um, uh, some of the departments are doing better than others. I, I think Social Security, a couple others are doing better. Some I worry about them being too slow. So uh, uh, Senator Bennett of Utah and I, along with Senator Dodd and and Senator Ashcroft, we put together a bipartisan coalition and passed legislation called the Y two K legislation. It allows a lot of our software companies 
to work together on this without running afoul of the antitrust laws. It allows uh, companies to try programs without without incurring unnecessary liability in trying to clear it up. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have a colossal problem as we come into the year 2000. Everything from our airplanes to uh, our electrical power systems. Uh, one example would be if the if this was not solved, if we did not adjust these computer programs so they can go into a new year, go into the year 2000 without thinking it's the year 1900, uh, we could have blackouts, uh, major blackouts of our electrical power or our water systems, everything else. Uh, obviously, we don't want that. It's not just the federal government. It's going to be a whole lot of other uh, um, municipal plants. It's going to be private companies and so on. Our legislation, I am told by all the people involved in the private industry as well as government, they tell me it's going to help a great deal to come together. But uh, I'm glad the year 2000 is not going to be this January. Dan, do you have some concerns about that? I do. Um, I've talked with a lot, a lot of different people about that, and, and um, it seems like there are some of the major uh, <coughs> industries are prepared for it, but uh, some of the more antiquated computer systems like the Federal Aviation uh, Administration and, and perhaps those of the, the government systems and, and also the power system, power companies, or maybe uh, it seems like from the reports that I've read or heard about that that they're a little behind schedule um, or just can't even bring their computer systems up to par to uh, to handle that transition from 1999 to 2000. So um, you hear a lot of a lot of different levels of of concerns, be it uh, that there's going to be a collapse of industrial society as we know it to Nothing's going to happen. Maybe a few lights won't come on or something like that. But. Well, I, I, I think it's a serious problem, and I'm not sure, you know, and we're also very much of an interconnected world. Everything from our financial world, as we've seen, when you can move billions of dollars around the world at a, uh, 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 by just uh, uh, touching a couple keystrokes on a computer, to the international communications, uh, satellite systems, travel, and so on. Uh, and some countries are set up better than others for this. Uh, but I think it is a serious matter, and that's why our Y2K legislation, I uh, spent a year trying to put this together and to get the support uh, across the political spectrum. The president signed uh, the Y2K bill uh, a couple of days ago. He told me he would if we get it through. He signed it. I think it's a major step forward, and we put a, a lot of extra money into the budget that just passed yesterday uh, for the Y2K problem. I wish we could have gotten the same consensus two years ago, uh, but I, I think we're a lot further ahead. But I still think we're going to have problems as we go in. Dan, thanks for your phone call. Let's talk to Beverly <clears throat> now, who I believe is calling from Bomazine. Hi, Beverly. Welcome to Switchboard. My question is to Mr. Tuttle. Since you say you don't want to go to Washington and you're also going to vote for Pat Leahy, why don't you bow out and save yourself a lot of stress? I think it would save myself a lot of stress, lady, but I don't really know what to do. <clears throat> um, I got a lot of people going to vote for me. Well, I hope Pat Leahy gets it. I, I can't really get down there. I got a knee operation. I got to have the other one done. So if I could, I would go, but I, I really can't. I'm, I'm, I'm not well enough. I'm too old. 79 years old. Okay. But you're still going to be there to give me advice if I yeah, do give Yeah, I'll give you advice. Okay, well, that's, uh, I remember you and Dottie are coming over to our house oh, next good. time for dinner. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Beverly, thanks for your phone call. Let's talk to Tim, who's calling from Woodstock. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Switchboard. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking my call. I have a question for Senator Leahy and Mr. Tuttle. Uh, I work with a small business, and uh, we have seven other people who work in this business, and a, a major concern of ours especially with some of the developments in uh, the financial markets recently, is that small businesses like ours are still going to have uh, the ability to borrow money from banks and in the capital markets if, uh, uh, you know, if those are uh, still available. Um, I was wondering what uh, you think government's involvement in making loans available to small businesses should be, and uh, Senator in particular, um, if you could comment on some of the things you've worked on along those lines. I think that we have to make capital available, and I, especially with small businesses. In, in our state, we, we often see the very large businesses, the, the IBMs, for example, or 
our general dynamics, things like that. But the largest gain in employment is in small businesses. I started back about five years ago in getting revolving loans for Vermont. So far, I've got something like $5 million in revolving loan money available to, to Vermont. This is money that can be used over and over again. So far, they've made loans to, to 200 small businesses here in Vermont. As 200 small businesses that expand, hire extra people, as they become solvent, there's more money to hire others. I think these revolving loan funds are some of the best things you can do. It allows, uh, it, it backs up banks and others in the loans. It makes capital available. There are a lot of there are a lot of entrepreneurs in Vermont, men and women, and and women have been among the the fastest growing area, who start businesses, uh, and that's where our fastest job growth is. So I think revolving loans are the, some of the best things we can do. I can bring in federal grants to some of these. Uh, programs, federal contracts, and so on, but the revolving loans work the best. Tim, thanks very much for your phone call. We'll be back with more of our program right after this short break. Incumbent Democrat Senator Patrick Leahy and Republican U.S. Senate candidate Fred Tuttle. Our phone number here at Switchboard is 1-800-639-2211. If you've got a question for either of the candidates or both or a comment, feel free to give us a call to talk about this very unusual U.S. Senate race. We're going to start off now and talk to Carolyn, who is calling from Williamstown. Hi, Carolyn. Welcome to Switchboard. Well, this Carolyn has been a Vermonter all her life, and I can go back three generations of being a Vermonter, and I'm quite old myself. However, uh, three years ago, I just come back from spending four and a half years in Oregon getting reacquainted with my sister, and two things happened. It is true that there are chickens that will lay colored eggs. She had some. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing is, is when I did come back to Vermont, the one thing I noticed, and I've lived in Vermont all my life, but when I came back from Oregon, the one thing I noticed that it is very expensive to live in Vermont. Now, can anyone explain this? Uh. When I was a boy back in, when you and I were both young, everything was cheap. I mean, you buy, buy a pair of shoes for $2, uh, 8 cents for a loaf of bread, 12 cents for a quart of, two quarts of milk or something like that, 5 cents a quart it was. And I think a pound of butter was around 16 cents. There have been quite a few changes, and everything was cheaper then, and we had a better time then. Everything was a lot better, I think, but... I don't know. In today's world, I really don't know. It costs me too much. My wife and I can just get by on Social Security and a little VA pension again. But, I mean, it's almost impossible for poor people to get by today. Don't you think so? Well, I'm talking mostly about taxes, sir. Oh, taxes? Yes. Oh, my God. Well, uh, the taxes have put a lot of the poor people had to sell their homes to uh, so they could live in a nursing home or something to get so they couldn't they couldn't pay their taxes. Okay, son of Leahy, you tell them. No, I, I, I think we do have very fairly significant tax burdens, especially if you're if you're not wealthy. If you're if you're extremely wealthy, there are all kinds of tax breaks uh, you can get, and you're eligible for. The average person, by the time they pay Social Security tax, pay their property taxes, uh, income taxes, uh, it takes a very big chunk out, especially if they're trying to save for, uh, pay their mortgage, or try to save for children's education, or save for their their own retirement. On the on the federal level, there have been some improvements made, uh, not the least of which is there an income tax credit. But I would hope that one of the things we will look at very carefully in the spring is when the um, Social Security Commission comes back and with its report to find some way so the average wage earner it is not saddled with ever increasing uh, Medicare and Social Security taxes. You mentioned Social Security. It's a good chance to ask both of you. How do you feel about privatizing part of Social Security, Senator Leahy? Well, you know, when the stock market was sky going up like a Nike rocket, I was getting all these letters from people saying, and yeah, we ought to privatize the whole Social Security system. Then we had about three days of the stock market dropping 300 to 500 to 600 uh, uh, points a day, and they're saying, don't touch my Social Security. Don't privatize it. My guess is that the commission is going to report, is going to come back, it's going to keep uh, most of Social Security similar to where it is and may allow uh, a small percentage. 
to, to go in some form of privatization, I think. Now, I have no inside knowledge of that. That's, a, that's more of a guess. But, Bob, what would make a lot more sense if the Congress, I mean, this year the Congress has spent all its time in very, very partisan wrangling. Would we not be a lot better off as a country if next spring the House and the Senate set aside a month of having a real debate, a real debate on the future of Social Security, uh, what part of the surplus might be used for it, how it's going to be invested, and where it's going to be spent. The American people would certainly have an interest in it, and for the first time you would see a widespread interest uh, throughout the country at all levels of people of, uh, of uh, that debate. That would help the country. Fred, what do you think about that? I think Pat Leahy has, has done a wonderful job talking about it. But when I was young, I mean, I was born in 1919. They claim I can't get so much Social Security until you get to be, what, 29 or something like that? You ever heard that? Is there a difference in that, Pat? Yeah, if you're born younger, you're, if you're born 19. Oh, it's, it's, a, different, uh, it's a different level. It's yeah. a different level. It's called the, uh, uh, the notch babies. What is, I don't get, I won't get so much yet. That's right. There's a certain notch in there, but... You're, you're getting Social Security now, aren't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting yeah. it now. Yeah, and it's, and we're, um, we're, we're going to make sure it's solvent for you there. Mike. I hope so, Pat. We, we all need Social Security. Social Security does a lot of good. It keeps a lot of older people. If they didn't have it. I remember years ago, before we had Social Security, we had a lady living on our house over in the field. She only got $8 a month as a, sort of a, one of the pension. What did they call that? When, it's not Social Security. She got, uh, old age assistance. Old age assistance. Old she age got assistance, $8 yeah. a month. She paid three dollars a month for rent, and she lived down the rest of it. She was happy. She was Arthur happy. Simpson was one of the ones. Uh, yeah. And they remember Arthur Simpson yeah, back yeah. in the fifties? Oh one yeah. The, yeah. That uh, lady was so happy because she got that much money. He yeah. wouldn't buy nothing day. No. Do you know the first person to get a Social Security check was a Vermonter? Is that right? Yep. Let's talk to John, who's calling from Montpelier. Hi, John. Welcome to Switchboard. Thanks. Um, I've got a quick question for both of you. Uh, to Mr. Tuttle, I know you got in this race to make a point and not to win, and I'm wondering whether you think you made your point and if you had it all to do over, if you do it over again. And, uh, Senator, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the matter of funding of and possibility of reform of the methods and even the mission of the IMF. All right. I, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I wanted to, but that's before I had my knee operation and all the things happened to me here, and I'm tired. And I guess that's about all I can say. The IMF needs uh, far more transparency. Uh, I don't think that we could have backed away from it this year. I think it was necessary to uh, uh, to put our funding in it. Otherwise, the whatever changes are made in it, there will be changes would be determined by the Europeans or others, not, not the U U.S. leadership, even though we're talking about areas where U.S. has some very vital uh, commercial and security interests. But I, uh, I think the IMF has got to realize that we are in a post-war, Cold War period. We are at a time when money moves much more rapidly around the world, when we're not talking about just two or three uh, economically viable countries, but many, many more. And the IMF has got to change a lot of its mission. I hope the United States can do that, it can can move them in that direction. Otherwise, they're not going to continue to get support from the Congress. John, thanks very much for your phone call. <clears throat> Let's talk to Dave, who's calling from Charleston, New Hampshire. Hi, Dave. Welcome to Switchboard. A question for Senator Leahy? Sure, go right ahead. Yes, Senator. Do you think... The president could have avoided all this the <laughs> scandal, uh, the star report, and God knows what else, from back in January, if he would have told the truth from the start, first question. And the second question is that, do you think he uh, ruined this young woman's life forever? I mean, like, do you think she can go anywhere, get a job? <sighs> <laughs> well, I don't know, Miss Lewinsky. Uh, I suspect that it's going to be a very difficult thing for her to just go in and say, "Hi, I'd like to work in your office." Uh, uh, my name is Monica Lewinsky. I do know that she's been offered several million dollars uh, in everything from her book to her um, appearance on was it 
uh, Roseanne show and, and others. So to that regard, I suspect that she is in a, an ability if she wants, and she apparently has been in negotiation for that to make far more money than most people her age will ever see in their lifetime. Uh, I wish the president had handled that differently. I wish he had never been involved with her. I also see a Kenneth Starr who is supposed to investigate a, a deal about whether the president made or lost $20,000 back 20 years ago, has spent $40 million, and has tried to basically uh, bolster a civil case, the Paula Jones case. Uh, I think that Kenneth Starr went way off, uh, way off track in this, and I think that's damaged the country. I think the president's conduct was indefensible, was wrong, uh, and I think it's something that he definitely uh, will suffer from the rest of his life. Dave, thanks for your phone call. Our number here at Switchboard, 1-800-639-2211. That's 1-800-639-2211. We're going to talk to another Dave. This one is calling from Burlington. Hi, Dave. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi, thank you. Mr. Tuttle, I'm a big fan of Man with a Plan, and I, I, I just think you're great, and Good. you provide a lot of us with some great entertainment. Mm -hmm. Likewise, likewise, wouldn't you agree that Senator Leahy is one of the finest and most decent senators this country he has sure ever is. had? He's the best senator and the finest we ever had in the state of Vermont. I think every senator in Vermont would tell us the same thing. He's done a wonderful job. He's helped Vermont. I don't know what Vermont would have been if it hadn't been for him down there helping us out. We got good highways. We got a good school system, and we have everything. It's a lot better than a lot of the other states. He's done a wonderful job. Well, thank you, Mr. Okay. Tuttle. I'm sure not going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept that. I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. I do appreciate yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. You're a good friend. Let's talk to Fletcher, who's calling from Callis. Hi, Fletcher. Welcome to Switchboard. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to um, thank the senator, first of all, for uh, his uh, courageous work on the ban of, on landmines around the world. I've supported that, and um, I'm happy to see that um, it seems to be making some forward progress, uh, albeit slow on, on the United States' behalf. But um, it looks like that might become a reality. And um, also his support for organic agriculture <clears throat> in this country. Um, I am a bit dismayed. I'm very dismayed at the uh, amount of money being spent on campaigns. I think that's part of the problem of uh, true democracy in this country. I think that there's a lot of <clears throat> a lot of lobbying by uh, defense industry, uh, which is helping to keep our military budget at a, at this uh, level just below the Cold War spending that we did. It's about 270 billion dollars, I believe, right now. Um, which is about, from what I understand, 17 times more than all of our enemies combined are spending. Uh, I also understand that the defense industry spends about three times in lobbying what the tobacco industry does, and we all know we've all gotten up in arms about how much uh, influence tobacco has over Congress. So I think that when we come to an issue like Act 60, which is such a hotly debated issue here in Vermont, it's got a lot of us um, well-meaning people pointing fingers and calling names at each other um, for relatively small amounts of money while we're spending in the area of $35 billion a year just to maintain a nuclear weapons program for weapons that we'll never even use, while 25% of Americans don't even, or can't even afford health insurance. Um, my question to the senator is, where does this all end, and how can we ever get off of this addiction to military spending? And would you support something like the like the uh, movement called Abolition 2000 to abolish nuclear weapons from the face of the earth? Fletcher, let me just follow up. Are you concerned about not only the military spending, but also just campaign finance reform in general, or how those two issues are tied together? Yeah, I think I think they can be tied together. I think part of it is that the incumbents will stay in office because of the uh, amount of money that industry will continue to. Uh, spend on them to keep them in office, keep them voting in favor of, of their interests. Okay. Yeah. Senator Leahy? Well, let me take the campaign finance reform. Uh, for the life of me, I cannot understand why the, the leadership in the House and the Senate blocked real campaign finance reform this year. You would think the people who have to go out and raise money 
would want real campaign finance reform. Uh, I'm the only person ever elected to federal office in, in Vermont who's done it without taking PAC money, uh, and I don't. Uh, I've seen how the scramble for PAC money allows too many of the special interests to come in, but what we ought to do is have real campaign finance reform, and it could be done, and could be done constitutionally, to limit the amount of t uh, money that you spend. For one thing, that would inf limit the influence of special interests. It would limit the time in campaigns. Some campaigns go on now for two or three years. For for example, for a Senate seat, uh, <coughs> it would limit the amount of money. You'd certainly cut out the negative ads, and there'd be a lot more interest in the uh, in the campaign. What I'm hearing from all the national media, Fred, who come up here, uh, they see the two of us going around to schools. Uh, Fred and I have been going around to uh, grade schools asking uh, kids to get their parents to take them to uh, to the voting booths the same way Fred's parents did with him and, and my parents did with me when we were little. And and they're amazed to see uh, a state with no negative ads, a state where people actually talk about talk about issues. If we did that, whether it's the military industrial complex or whether it's any other, they would have a lot less interest, uh, a lot less influence, rather. Uh, on the question of nuclear weapons, they will not be removed uh, from the face of the earth by the year 2000, unfortunately. I wish they could. I wish all nuclear weapons, I wish all landmines could. These are things that take a long time. Far more people have been killed and maimed and wounded by landmines than any other type of uh, the, the, uh, nuclear weapon. But we are getting somewhere with that. We will remove them uh, from the face of the earth. And I, I will always be proud of the involvement that I've had in that. But it is going to be done, all of these things are going to be done when we get back to real campaign finance reform, and we do not have it today. Fred, any comment about uh, campaign finance uh, reform? I don't know anything about that, but Pat Leahy has done a wonderful job on those landmines. Out in World War II over in France, I've seen good men in. We walked through minefields. We laid a pipeline through minefields. None of us, one, two, got hurt. But I, he's doing such that those landmines are going to kill a lot of people if they don't get rid of them, and they should stop the landmines all over the world. They're a dangerous thing, and I'm still afraid of them today. If I trip on a wire or something I don't see, I, I almost I almost died a couple of years ago when I hit, just tripped over wires, so scared. I, those are inside of me, all those mines, that's all of that. Okay, I guess that's okay. Thank you. Okay, let's talk to Myrie, who's calling from Thedford. Hi, welcome to Switchboard. Thank you, and good evening. I think I have a comment. I think this is a travesty on our system of selecting candidates for the Senate to represent our state. And it's a travesty on your very excellent program for debate between the two candidates or for chances for them to give perhaps uh, opposing viewpoints on subjects. It is also something of an insult to Fred Tuttle. He was urged by another to be a candidate. That person secured the necessary signatures. And when the primary vote was taken, Democrats, who were eager to have Leahy return to the Senate, could choose the Republican ballot and vote for him, Mr. Tuttle, as a less formidable opponent to Mr. Leahy. As you can tell, Mr. Leahy has had just about the whole program a fine opportunity to talk, talk, talk about his ideas. And Mr. Tuttle gives over his time to Mr. Leahy for the most part. He has admitted he doesn't want to go to Washington. He is too old for the position, he thinks. And uh, we know his wife has beautiful roses that she doesn't mm. want to leave here in Vermont at this point in their lives. Now, it seems to me that perhaps this irregularity of voting for uh, another ballot than your own party so that you can choose a weaker candidate should certainly be changed in this state, in all fairness. And I cannot feel that I have any, any uh, more appreciation for what Mr. Leahy has done because he has simply taken the balance of this program to say what he feels about the various issues. And I want Mr. Tuttle to know that he must stand up for his own self and what he wants to do and not let the man who made the movie about him or anybody else take advantage uh, of him. 
John John O'Brien doesn't have too much to say about this. And McMillan came in here, and he did. He's only been here uh, just a few months over the other side of the mountain somewhere, and he thought he was going <coughs> down to Washington and turn everything around. He thought he's going to get all the votes down there, and so not really John, but somebody else told me he said we got to beat McMillan. I said, well, I'll do, I'll do what I can, but I didn't expect I was going to get anything out of it all in the night. To, vote come through. I was really surprised. I didn't think I'd get any vote, but of course I'm well known around Vermont through John's movie and a lot of places we've been. We go a lot of places uh, to visit with children and see if we can make things happier for people and stuff like that. So I don't lay it on John O'Brien. I don't lay it on to nobody what happened. To, I think uh, it's just something happened. Okay? I might say on this, Bob, I voted my own party's primary. I made it very clear in the press and everybody else. I urged Democrats to vote in the Democratic primary. And some might, this idea that somehow the Democrats, I wish we were that organized. Good Lord, do I wish we were that organized, be able to go in and change another party's primary. We're not. Uh, the, um, uh, really, the caller is saying she doesn't trust the Vermont voters. Uh, I do. Uh, the Vermont voters made it very clear. These are people going in voting. Uh, because a lot of the vast majority of voting because of the Dwyer in Rome primary and then decided how they were going to vote here. They made one statement very clear. Uh, you don't have to be born in Vermont to run for office, obviously, but you ought to at least show you have some commitment to our state before you run. And what they said to the man from Massachusetts, the millionaire from Massachusetts, we're not a theme park in Vermont. Don't think just because you have a million dollars to buy some kind of an admission ticket that you can come into Vermont and have anything you want. We Vermonters take our politics far too seriously than that. We take our government far too seriously than that. And if somebody is going to run for office in Vermont, they ought to show at least some commitment to our state, not just uh, uh, treat it as something because they have a lot of money that it's an opportunity. It's not. Vermont is a very much a way of life, and we Vermonters feel that very, very strongly. And I, I think that what, what happened with Fred Tuttle... Uh, I saw the, I was at parades, uh, I watched the reaction of, of people on the street, uh, I, I went to a number of things, it was very obvious from Vermonters, and I'm talking about Vermonters that I know are lifelong Republicans, who said that they would not vote for the uh, man from Massachusetts, they were voting for Fred because they wanted to send a very strong message, you should have to show some commitment to our state before you can run for office. I think for a lot of people who were watching that campaign, the Northfield Labor Day Parade was a real eye-opener. Fred, you got quite a reception in yes, Northfield, yes, didn't you? Yes, it was. Yeah, that's what started it all off. We've been to a lot of parades, and that's what done it. I think that's what tipped a lot of reporters off, that your support was a lot deeper than uh, a lot of us ever suspected. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Let's get a call in from Amy, who's calling from Groton. Hi, Amy. Welcome to Switchboard. Hi. Um, I have a question for... Um, for Fred, being a retired dairy farmer, and also for Senator Leahy, um, I would like to know what your positions are on the RBGH um, in milk and dairy products. What you tell us? The, the BST, or, or you talking about BST or the RBGH? Right. Um, well, the, the state and the federal government says it's legal, uh, and that's so that makes it legal. I, frankly, I think that. Um, uh, farmers ought to be able to make their own mind on that, and they ought to be able they ought to be allowed to label whether they're using it or not using it. Fred, uh, what do you think about that? I've been a farmer all my life. We shipped milk years ago, as long ago as I can remember. We shipped good, clean milk to the creamery. That milk, we never milk can to creamery was fit for any baby to drink all over Vermont or anywhere in Massachusetts. And then they come out of all this modern stuff, the pipeline milk, I see, and nobody knows how that is washed thoroughly every day or not. They give the cows all kinds of shots to make them give more milk. They put stuff in the grain today, so the grain isn't so good. Some of the hay isn't so good. And then they expect that milk's going to be fit for children. I don't believe it, and I never will. they got to go back to the old-fashioned way of farming. I think that's a pretty clear answer. I do, too. <laughs> It's uh, right near the end of the program now, and we're going to turn to our closing statements from our candidates. We have a uh, one-minute closing statement from Fred Tuttle. Okay. Pat Leahy is a good man. He's a good senator, too. Pat Leahy and Jim Jeffers make a good team. They've done a lot for Vermont. It's too bad that they are both lawyers, though. I can't figure out how to beat Pat Leahy. Orient Hatch likes Pat. Ted Kennedy likes Pat. 
Even my wife, Dottie, is going to vote for Pat. Pat Leahy is a senator who thinks he might like to be a movie star. Fred Tuttle is a movie star who thinks he'd like to be a senator. Maybe for Vermont's sake, we shouldn't quit <laughs> our, our, our day's job. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Fred Tuttle. I'm going to go back home and watch Man with the Plan again after that. Thank you, Fred. You know, Thomas Jefferson once said that he likes the dreams of the future better than the history of the past, and we're at the dawn of an age of an unlimited possibilities. Great promise for Vermont and our country. Uh, the most wonderful democracy history's ever known. My dream for the next century is that Vermont's a place where our lakes and streams are clean, our farms are fertile, and where we export every product we produce except for our children. And I want the vote of Vermonters. I want to represent my native state. And my pledge to Vermonters is I will do my utmost to help Vermont as we go into the next century. And it's going to be a century that our children will know as the best century yet. That's a pledge I make to Vermonters as I ask for their support. And I thank Fred and Dottie for theirs. I thank you, Pat. That was a wonderful statement. Coming up next, a debate between the candidates for Maryland governor. Then just after midnight, today's Middle East Peace Accord signing ceremony, followed by a briefing with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and Middle East Peace Coordinator Dennis Ross. At around 10 past 2, a Wisconsin U.S. Senate debate, followed by the discussion with Vermont's U.S. Senate candidates. We have more debates coming up this weekend. Tomorrow night at 10, a New York U.S. Senate debate. Then Sunday at noon, debates between the candidates for the South Carolina U.S. Senate and Minnesota governor's seats. And Sunday at 10 p.m., another New York U.S. Senate debate. Campaign 98 coverage continues this weekend here on C-SPAN. In a minute, we'll show you a Maryland governor's debate. But first, we'll hear from political analyst Charlie Cook about the race. The Maryland governor's race is going to be one of the best.